Here in the Northern Rockies, dark winter months are outlasted in basements, dens, and nooks, where kindred souls gather to share intel, swap fly patterns, and relive the memories from seasons past. This gathering spot, known locally as a February room, is the inspiration for this podcast. No matter the season, the door is always open to those with a fly fishing story to tell. Brought to you by CD Fishing USA, the North American distributor for composite developments, fly rods, and fishing accessories. Tech, precision, ingenuity, legacy. Go to cdfishing.us and follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. Here's your host, Lauren Carnop, and this is The February Room. Welcome to the February Room. Today, my guest is Matt Devlin. He is the founder of Montana Fishing Film Festival. Thank you for joining me today, Matt. Howdy. It's uh, great to be here. (laughs) And Matt, you have an incredible job that focuses... And Matt, you have an incredible job that focuses on fishing stories on the big screen. And I can only imagine that with a job like that, you must have some good stories yourself. And I would love to hear one. Yeah, you know, I think I have, I think I've got a few, like, like most people that have been, been at this a while. I have fished all over the country and, uh, you know, I've, I've lived in different states and I'm, I'm definitely a trout fisherman first I think uh you know I've I've done some saltwater fishing I I lived uh in the Keys for a little while and I I grew up on the Chesapeake Bay and I guess that really this is just a long way of saying I'm gonna just quickly tell a story that is set in Charleston South Carolina where I lived for about two years after college and it was sort of just one of those, you know, sitting sitting on a back porch having a beer with a buddy in Annapolis, Maryland, where I grew up, and you know, he mentioned there's this cool town, Charleston. Let's just move there. And I said, Okay, cool. And I think like two weeks later, like both of our summer jobs teaching sailing were ending and we loaded up our respective vehicles and moved down there and I didn't have a hitch on my vehicle at the time and my buddy had like an old Volvo station wagon that had a hitch so he he towed my boat but this uh this old basically an old fiberglass John boat that my dad and I put a center console on and did all this woodwork on it we put mahogany rails on it and it, it was at that point, it kind of needed some TLC. And I was like a 22 year old kid that didn't have a lot of TLC to give. So we're, we're kind of, we're, we're starting out sort of in a, what you could call kind of a haggard boat that, you know, there's like barely any fuel pressure and it would like, you know, you get it up on plane and it would run for five minutes and then like the engine would start choking. and. It was sort of like every time you left the dock, you just didn't really know exactly what adventure lay before you. But on on this day, we were, as 22-year-olds often are, we were like violently hungover. I remember, I remember eating like two 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 bacon, egg, and cheese biscuits at McDonald's. Like sort of thinking like, oh yeah, you know, like hair of the dog, like get some get some grease in your belly. And I think you know. Right as we were kind of like leaving the channel where we put the boat in, I was like realizing that that was not a good idea. So I was feeling, I was feeling a little queasy, but I I held it together. And uh, my buddy and I, Alex, we, at that point, we we really didn't know what was, what was going on with the fishing scene there. And he was primarily a spin fisherman and I was a fly fisherman and I had, you know, a seven weight with a little crab pattern, but we were trying to catch redfish and I don't know how much you know about the the fishing scene in Charleston, but it's it's all about these these tailing tides that you get. And it takes it takes about five and a half feet of water on your max high tide to get water up on these hard bottom flats that have what's called spartina grass and then when the water gets up in there, 
the fiddler crabs kind of move around and the water's kind of invading their home and they're moving around and the redfish come out of the channels and kind of the the backwaters and where all the shelter islands are and stuff and they will move up onto these flats and and feed on fiddler crabs and that essentially causes them to tail because it's shallow water and they're they're kind of rooting around almost like carp do basically hunting and kind of nosing around and looking for crabs and we we knew that you know based on the tide tables like literally like the farmer's almanac that it was going to be like a 5-8 tide or something and we didn't know where we were going we were just like in this haggard old boat and saw some you know some spartina grass and thought that might be good and we pulled over there and waited and you know sure enough it was it was the right time and you know the water started coming in and they they get these huge tides in south carolina and if, if you ever see like the waterfront houses they have these like 100 and 200 foot docks because there's such a massive shift between max high and max low and so so we're getting you know this 5.8 which is 5.8 feet of, of water shifting and so like it just starts to, to rise literally and it's like you're sitting on these flats that are dry as a bone and then the water just like it just fills in like somebody you know opened a dam and you know we're sitting there that we're like you know been living in Charleston a month or two and really just have like some advice we got at a fly shop that I actually ended up working at for like a year and a half but um after that but we're sitting there you know super green and just kind of like hoping like man wouldn't that be cool if it happened and all of a sudden the water just starts rising and coming onto the flat and we're you know sitting there standing there dry and all of a sudden it's like you know hitting our feet and then it's ankle deep and then it's like shin deep and right right around knee deep it kind of stops and you know we're like just kind of looking around nursing hangovers it's it's hot i mean it's it's dead summer actually it was late summer in in the south which is pretty hot to say the least and all of a sudden these tails just pop up and it's literally it's like it, it feels almost like a dry fly hatch, you know, because it's like, there's a tail, there's a tail, and and it's a, it's a unique thing that happens in that part of the low country that you get these tailing tides. And, you know, at, at a certain point, I think one of the, one of the tails just kind of turned towards where I was on the flat and it cruised towards me and I cast towards it and kind of had the patience to leave my crab there for a second and it's it just swam towards it opened its gills and ate it and I you know I strip set and everything just came together and I think it is just one of those you know one of those cool moments in fishing where it's like oh that was like my first you know tailing fish I caught and it it kind of learning the patience and reading what the fish are doing and letting them sort of come to you I think has Getting, getting into that taught me a lot about trout fishing as well. So that's that's kind of, that's my rambling uh, first first tailing redfish in South Carolina story. Did the hangover uh, ease its pain after <laughs> catching the fish? <laughs> I would say, Lauren, I would say momentarily. <laughs> I've been with a couple of guides and whenever I see them grab a, grab a fly and they're shaking a little bit and like oh it's a good it was a good evening well tell me a little bit more about how you came about uh the montana fishing film festival how did that come to fruition so fast forward a number of years and i i ended up uh in missoula i actually did my last year of school in missoula and went back east and then came back about 12 or 13 years ago and I was guiding at the time. I think I just just started, like my, maybe my second year or something. And a good friend of mine, Bryce McLean, who uh, grew up down in the Bitterroot Valley, we had made this film called Ten Days. 
and we filmed it in Southwest Montana. And it was it was myself, Bryce McLean, and then a guy named Josh Rokosh, who we kind of we all ended up being guides at one point or another. And we had made this film. We we wanted to show it to people. It it didn't you know it didn't have the production. I don't. I hesitate to say production value, but I would say it didn't have the production budget of of you know films that were were being highlighted in like these bigger film tours. It, we we literally shot it on a Canon seventy D, which was like one of the first SLRs that had kind of good you know f- video specs. Uh, we shot it on a seventy D that we bought that Bryce bought from Costco with like a three lens kit. And then we were kind of like so broke at the time he returned it. They have like a 10 day or like a two week return policy. So like he bought it, we filmed this film and then he literally, he literally went back into Costco and was like, you know, it's not, it's not going to work for me. And he returned it. And so, you know, that that cut down on production costs uh, <laughs> certainly, and so we ha- we're sitting on this film, and you know those those bigger film tours weren't really an option for us, and it it seemed sort of like an afterthought to just you know put it online, and I I think I just you know came up with like hey let's let's just show it to people ourselves, let's run a theater. And so we we did that. We rented the Crystal Theater, and well, the, it's not there anymore. It's now now it's there's like you know fermenters and they're making making beer where it was, but uh, which which will happen in Missoula. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I know. You see something? It's either going to be a cell phone store or a brewery. Yeah, it does. It does feel that way. Uh, so you know we we had this event. You know. The, the shell of an event built around a 15 minute film. And we decided, you know, we needed to kind of build the lineup. So it was a little bit longer and people might actually, you know, pay 10 bucks to come see it. And so we, we got some other films and it just kind of came together and we sold tickets. And I remember there was a, they did an article about it and in the paper and you know, I guess the word kind of got out, but we we sold it out, and then we were we were like calling uh, Dave and Shirley, who owned the building, and like double checking what the you know fire marshal capacity was, and like getting camp chairs from my mom's garage, and trying to like cram as many people in there as we could, and it you know it was a success, I think, for like the the first year, and that, that was seven years ago now. Um, and at that point, I just realized that there was an appetite for this sort of thing. And like our, our whole, our whole vibe is, is highlight, you know, people fishing close to home and the, the production budgets and production value have, have definitely gone up and up and up every year since that first year. But I think kind of the soul of, of the, the, the style and the type of films that we like to show has kind of remained the same it's you know it's almost all trout fishing and we we really just want our films to be relatable are you wanting your videos to be more focused on like trout waters or are you looking at videos kind of like charleston with the red fishing so we you know we we don't know where it's gonna where this thing's gonna end up when everything's said and done but right now we're we're kind of focused on trout and you know, I don't, I don't have anything against saltwater fish. They're, they're great, and they've, you know, they've captured a lot of people's imaginations. But I think that this industry really exists because of trout. And I think what we've seen over the past, you know, five years has been really, in a lot of ways, kind of a shift away from that. And I think, I think companies are shifting back towards it because they're realizing like, Hey, this is the bread and butter of the sport. But you know, a a 20 year old kid going to college, you know, his, his opportunities to put a fly in front of a permit or a tarpon, you know, are, are 
far, far less than his opportunity to go chase trout. And so we, we like to kind of highlight that, you know, weekend trip that everybody can take. Oh, absolutely. Well, and I know you said that you had the Crystal Theater, but this year you kind of had to shake things up due to COVID. Yeah, and obviously yeah. now the Crystal Theater is not even there anymore. So where are you uh, showcasing your films? So we, we sort of, we outgrew the Crystal and we did it at the Roxy Theater, which is a little bit bigger and kind of outgrew that. And our new home was the Denison Theater on campus at the University of Montana. But with COVID, it, it just didn't come together this year. And we had an opportunity to work with the local minor league team in Missoula, the Paddleheads, and hold a socially distanced show. And it was an awesome event. You know, I think they're re- really leading the way, certainly in this city, for providing entertainment. And honestly, on a national scale, they're kind of creating a blueprint for socially distanced events. And they've got squares, you know, painted off that are six feet apart. And it it was a, you know, they, they did a really good job. And so that, that was, that was a fun event. And I think, you know, the future of the festival might, might be at that, at that baseball field. Well, I mean, the backdrop of it, it's also super beautiful. You have the Clark Fork, you have the mountains. And I think what you said about kind of this classic feel, I think that that stadium kind of encompasses Missoula and the river runs through it kind of classic feel of um, kind of being in nature. Yeah. I mean, and, and doing it, you know, the other thing is it, it sort of creates a natural shift away from that that late winter, spring you know, time that that we used to do the event towards summer when you have you have weather nice enough to actually hold an outdoor event. And we've never done an event, you know, in late August, but this year, I mean, it couldn't have been a better evening. It was just like, you know, mid seventies, like perfect, perfect Montana evening. And I mean, what, what better place, you know, you could literally go fishing throwing hoppers through town and pull out at the boat ramp that is maybe maybe like 25 feet from the baseball field where else can you do that i wanted to say that you know you also are still a creator creating all these um also creating fly fishing films and you know it's not just about the fishing it's kind of the story behind it so for as a filmmaker how are you coming up with these stories? What are you looking for? That's a great question. I think for me, I, I come from a writing background and, you know, the first, really the only job I ever talked about having growing up was being a writer. Like from a young age, I, you know, I was like <laughs> like a first grader writing poetry. And, and so that, you know, that's what I pursued in college. And I think for whatever reason, it's kind of my storytelling has morphed into a different medium but for me I'm always looking at the story and the human interest and I think I sort of tend to approach I I, I, I think I tend to approach a fly fishing film as a documentary first almost as a, a sports documentary about a person and sort of view view the you know fish porn element as secondary to the narrative absolutely i think the one that um i have watched the land sick can you give me a little bit of insight and how you came up with this with that with that film yeah so land sick is a film i made in 2017 and it's the story of musician chuck reagan who Oddly enough, I just uh, I just went fishing with up in the upper Blackfoot area. I think like three days ago, he was he was in town doing some stuff at uh, Paws Up, and we yeah we just we just hung out. So that's that's kismet because I I probably see him you know once every eighteen months or something. But he was a friend of a friend, and 
we met in a drift boat on the Clark Fork. I think it was like early April. And he and I just kind of hit it off. And he was in town playing some music. I think he had just played a show in British Columbia and was on his way to Bozeman and like, you know, slept for two hours in the back of his truck. And like, he, he just, uh, if you if you watch the film, Landsick, it's, it's on Costa Del Mar's uh, YouTube channel. You, you get the impression that he's just kind of one of these guys that, you know, kind of has the, has the pedal on the gas more often than not. But the day I met him, it was, you know, certainly that was the case. And we just kind of hit it off. And I think I, I was talking to him later about it and he was like, yeah, you know, you're like one of those dudes where I just feel like we played Little League together or something. And, and I was like, I was like, well, I played lacrosse, bro. But, uh, <laughs> but no, he, so uh, he, he actually, Chuck is just like, you know, one of the most interesting people I've ever met, but he actually could have gone pro. I think he might have even gotten drafted to play in the minor leagues as a catcher, but he was like, had could have had a baseball career. But anyway, that's a totally different story. Uh, he and I just hit it off and it was pretty simple. He just approached me and was sort of like, hey, you know, I've been wanting to do something and tell a story and I think he wanted to find a filmmaker that he felt would would kind of be along for the ride and and not not overproduce it, you know, like for I, I went on tour with him all over the northeast and the Midwest and uh I went out to California a little bit and really, you know, we never had a shot list or anything at, at really at any point. It was just sort of like approaching it from a you know, journalistic kind of let's make a documentary, let's follow Chuck around and kind of see what happens and see see what the story is and allow it to kind of unfold and then, you know, fill in the blanks where we need to. But I think, it, you know, it was it was simple. We just, we met in a drift boat and he said, I want to tell a story. And I said, cool. And I I connected to what he was going through in his life because I was also a new father and that's one of the big elements in the film and kind of how he's found some healing through being a dad and and uh you know just watch it i guess if you haven't but oh it's so touching i mean honestly though it is what you said it's exhausting i don't know how someone can keep keep moving like that i think one of my favorites i i mean i think you should anyone who's listening should watch it because there's that one part where he's almost sleeping in the car and it's just like it's almost like he's trying to catch any z's he can at any minute because he's always on the go um you have a new project that's coming up though correct yeah yeah i do it's called the streak and what's that about so the streak is about these two fishing buddies that live in the bitterroot valley and Chris McLean and Rick Branzell, and they have a almost 20 year streak of catching a trout from a drift boat out of the main stem of the Bitterroot every month of the year. So they've, you know, pursued these fish every month. And, you know, obviously during runoff and during the middle of winter, there's some challenging months and you know, it's a it's it's a it's a great story, and I I filmed it over an entire year. So every month, I went I went fishing with them, and you know we got we got pretty close. And I'm I'm really happy with the way that turned out. And it's it's again, I think it's definitely a, a story driven piece. And and when can you access that? Project? So so we were actually showing that as part of this year's lineup of films and this past show in Missoula represented pretty much the end of the tour. I mean, we, we only got three of 26 planned tour stops completed before the pandemic hit and we were able to add Missoula 
as kind of a, you know, really like a season saving show. So now, you know, it, it, the, the streak is done being shown on tour and we're going to be making it available for download October 1st through my Vimeo page. But the, the way to, to view that film and download it is just to go to pmdfilm.com. That's my production house and there'll be a link there. And we're, we're sort of uh, launching the film through an article that I wrote for Fly Fisherman Magazine about the making of the film. And that'll, that'll hit newsstands like, I want to say October 3rd. I think it ships the first week of October, so. Congratulations. I always love hearing that when hard work is being recognized, so I'm happy to hear that your work is being recognized and being sent out to the public because um, you do have a really great way of storytelling. I'm curious, though, with all this traveling that you've done, do you get to go fishing yourself or are you always behind the lens? <laughs> so I, I was uh, filming a lot and behind the lens a lot, and my day job was still taking people fishing. Uh, I was a guide for 11 years in Missoula, and I've transitioned out of that. And, you know, it just reached a point where I, I wasn't really like creating any space to take days off. And I think, you know, any fishing guide can relate and kind of goes through it. And I think some people find that balance and some people don't, but typically the, uh, you know, I would say the 10 year mark is kind of as a fishing guide where you decide whether you're going to kind of like step back or step away or kind of sign on for, you know, life. And I decided to step away. And so I guess to answer your question, I've fished a lot more this year. And even, even with the pandemic, I've, you know, just been getting out and wade fishing and, you know, not, not so worried about finding a buddy that can row and, you know, taking the boat and I've probably only floated a couple times this whole summer, but I've, I've found time to just kind of, you know, fish simply close to home, you know, kind of dry fly, four way, small stream, kind of, you know, fun fishing that, that we have, you know, so much available to us around Missoula. Have you caught anything noteworthy? Yeah, um, yeah, I've cut, you know, a couple nice fish. I, I got a, I got a really big fish. It's like a 23 or so inch brown trout during the squall hatch. And I mean, I, it's probably been, it's probably been since I started guiding that I like really spent a whole day by myself wade fishing, you know, but it, we were social distancing was kind of happening at that time. And we were actually kind of in the lockdown mode at that you know, in, back in March. And so, you know, it kind of forced me to get out solo and just, you know, slow down and like fish just a little section of river. And it was, it was super rewarding. And, you know, I've caught a couple, a couple nice fish this summer. So, you know. Oh, I think it's great that you're making time for yourself. I went fishing for the first time, like wade fishing by myself. I always go with my husband normally, and he's like, Lauren, just go by yourself. Go, go on the river. And I was like, okay, well, I brought so many things. I brought, I brought a bunch of snacks. I brought a book. I brought, obviously brought my bear spray thinking that in case um, I get into danger. And um, I was like, what am I going to, is this going to go by I'm going to be so bored. I had six hours to myself to do this and it went by so fast. And it's so interesting when you're kind of stuck in your mind and your thoughts, how time kind of really does go by fast when you're, uh, when you're alone. Nice to kind of think through all those thoughts, I guess. I totally agree. Yeah, it is. It's very soothing. I never really thought I was one of those people who could go wade fishing by themselves, but now I'm kind of, I'm totally into it, especially being a parent like you and someone who works on the side, you kind of get stuck into this idea that you always have to be on the go. Um, kind of like Chuck probably, but he's on a totally different, <laughs> totally different level. So if someone's interested in uh, wanting to maybe create a video, what are the requirements or maybe there's a better way for them to 
uh, go to a site to learn about that? Yeah, that's a great question. So through through the Film Fest website, mtfishingfilmfest.com, there's some information, you know, on the drop down menu about submission guidelines. And really, it's just the easiest way is just to email me and kind of start a dialogue. And my email is just mtfishingfilmfest at gmail.com. But, you know, we, we've we shown films from two minutes to 25 minutes, you know, and stuff from GoPro footage to, you know, full-on, you know, professional 4K, 6K, you know, footage and, and, and everything in between. So I just, I think that I just like a compelling story and something that is interesting to watch. And maybe they can even just go to Costco if they don't have all the gear. <laughs> There's a 10-day return so they can return the equipment, right? That's right. I'm, I'm not sponsored by Costco. Well, I really appreciate talking with you today. And um, I really look forward to your new um, film um, and accessing that in, was that October? Yeah, October 1st, I'm going to make it live. Awesome. Well, um, and I hope that... I get to, maybe I will start coming up with some ideas and storytelling. I think, you, like you said, it's all about the personal stories behind the fishing. Um, I find those to be actually so much more entertaining than just the music videos of catching ginormous fish. Because in reality, you know exactly how it felt being on those trips, right? They're just on the boat and they're fishing and they caught one humongous fish, but they chop it up to make it seem like it's extreme fly fishing and honestly for me I don't feel like fly fishing for me isn't extreme it's about the story behind it and kind of just like this podcast it's about the people and the stories and it's not always about the, the crazy music video stuff yeah and it's like it's like how many beat drops can you have in one you know just kind of a word to anybody that might be listening and and yourself included, Lauren, we're like always looking for more female voices in the in the film festival, whether that's the filmmaker or the subject of the films. And, you know, we we can't show what what we don't have submitted. So, you know, I, I always try to create some space for those female anglers to kind of have a platform in our film festival. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to have more 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 ladies voices you know heard uh your wish is my command i can get a whole army of women and i just got to come up with a good uh personal story behind it but i'll get my i'll start thinking about it um but yeah well lauren have your people call my people <laughs> i will i will it might be a, a five-year-old voice <laughs> Well, thank you again, Matt, and I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, thanks again. Yeah, th thank you. Take care. Go to thefebruaryroom.com where you can access a complete library of our podcast and read more about our guests, their fishing stories, and favorite fly patterns. We're always looking for exceptional fly fishing yarns. And if you have one to spend, shoot us an email at info at thefebruaryroom.com. The February Room is always free. But if you feel like throwing a nickel in the pond, we appreciate any additional listener support. For companies and individuals interested in sponsorship opportunities, please contact us for our media kit. Thanks for stopping by the February Room, and we'll see you down here next week.